Hi, Andrew. Hi, Austin. So there's still people in room 227. Uh, do you know when they're supposed to be out? I imagine that class also ends at um, 350. So um, it's OK. I mean, it's pretty easy to get set up in there. And even if you have to start a little bit late, wait for way to come help out. Basically, okay. if, if you haven't done it before, you turn the computer should already be on. And um, there's a Zoom uh, button on there. And either you, um, sorry, you don't have to activate Zoom on the computer. Um, you, you just plug your computer in and do a screen share from your computer. And then on the computer in the room, you click HDMI or something like that, whichever, however you do the connection. Uh, and then your um, laptop will be on the big screen and then I think actually maybe you do have to join Zoom on the computer in the room so that the people who call in through Zoom can see through the cameras. Um, uh, I'll try to get so, up. There. I'll try to get the uh, display set up first, and then we can worry about the Zoom. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the display is super easy. It's it's practically foolproof as long as you cool. if you use the HDMI cord and it goes into HDMI on your computer and you push the HDMI button on the yeah. thing in the room, you'll be fine. Right. The slightly trickier thing is getting Zoom started in the room because you have to either um, navigate to the link, like if you can pull up your Gmail and right. then navigate to Barbara's Inside link, that's probably yeah, that's probably most efficient. Alternatively, you can activate the Zoom program and type in the passcode and the room ID. Um, I, have, I have to do that on the computer, which is in the room, not on my laptop, right? Yeah, I mean, I think for you have to, you do have to activate Zoom on the computer in the room. But I think if I remember right, the easiest way is just to pull up your own email on that computer. Right, okay. If, if, that, if that's possible, and then click on the link there. Um, <laughs> I think that should get it working. Um, worst case scenario, yeah, that should be fine. I think that should be fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. I now it looks I'm out running an errand. I'm sitting in the car waiting for something, but uh, I will be late for the beginning of the talk. So okay. apologies for that. I I do hope to join before too long, but at the rate this is going, I'm not sure how long too long it's okay. going to be. It's no problem. Um, I'm sure we would. But in any event figure it out yeah yeah way will get you introduced and um and handle questions and stuff at, at the end too okay so should be fine all right um yeah yep, let me looking go forward to the, the talk. I'll, I'll be back in a sec okay
Hey, Austin, have you been able to um, work it out? No, I'm still working on it. I got a bit of a late start. So Frank, what way is here? So I'm sure he'll help me out. Okay. Okay, can people outside hear us? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, can you hear us? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You can hear me well, Frank? Yes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
So now, uh, Andrew said we need to hit some HDMI button in order to share the screen. HDMI button. Yeah. Is it on here on the control? Or? I'm not too sure. Andrew, on there. Andrew, are you there? So I can use this speaker, but there's heat feedback. Okay, what I'm is I'm a presentation. Hear the... We cannot hear that. Well, there's feedback. <coughs> I can disconnect this computer. Later on, if you want to see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there's speakers that are properly working. Download. Hmm? Uh, down, download into download the file and then open. Okay, I guess we can. Okay, can can also, can can also hear us? Yes, we can still hear you. Can hear us. Okay. Uh, it's very difficult for us to hear the outside. Though. So if you have so, questions, yeah. maybe type them into the Zoom chat. Yeah. And then we'll fill it afterwards. Yeah. If you have a question, you just you type. You can type anytime, and uh, in the end, you look at it. Okay. So uh, let me. But is outside it. able to see the slides? No, we're not. Frank, can you okay, see the slides? No, we cannot see your slides. <laughs> you cannot see this. 
if you present from your laptop, um, if that's, are you presenting from your laptop, Austin? Ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that should be fine. Okay, you guys can see now. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, we'll go ahead and start. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about you there. Yeah, so I think uh, let me just get started. Um, uh, introduce um, our speaker today. Um, so today's seminar will be given by our own uh, Austin Beatty. So Austin um, got his PhD uh, from MIT uh, in 2019. Um, uh, so Austin and I actually graduated from the same advisor uh, at MIT. Um, he, uh, he entered MIT around the year I started here. Uh, you know, I started a new career around the same time. And, um, <clears throat> and after he, he, he graduated, um, and I, um, I had uh, uh, the opportunity to, to attract him uh, to rise. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, when he was a graduate student, we already uh, had a lot of uh, uh, interactions and, and uh, collaborations. And back then, it was, uh, it was uh, during the early days of LHC, and uh, it was a very uh, exciting time. Of course, you, you know that we discovered Higgs uh, in 2012, and, but in, the, in nuclear physics, um, in high level collisions, we also yeah, there are also a lot of uh, interesting, uh, exciting discoveries around that time. Um, and and uh, some of the things we, we have uh, discovered are still trying to understand uh, what we mean. And so, yeah, so Austin will, will tell you about the physics of quantum plasma and, and also some of the work uh, uh, he, he, he has done uh, recently. So, that's awesome. Okay, thanks, Wayne. So thanks for having me at this seminar. Today I will be discussing uh, trillion degree matter and probing the emergence of the uh, quark one cosmos. <coughs> and I put the word uh, emergence in italics there because I think that's kind of a theme of my talk. So emergence has uh, kind of two definitions. The first definition is probably the one you think of, which is the creation of something. Um, but actually, there's also kind of another definition that's a bit more philosophical, which is related to emergent phenomenon. Emergent phenomenon is basically when you have a system which is composed of simpler parts, and when you let those parts interact together, they exhibit more complicated behavior than if you just look at each individual part by itself. And I think you'll find by the end of this talk that not only is the creation of the core growing plasma very interesting, but also that it's emergent phenomenon that it shows are really a rich tapestry of things to be studied. So let me give you an example of some emergent phenomena. So consider a box full of water molecules, right? We know these water molecules interact via electromagnetic interactions. We understand electromagnetism pretty well. So let me ask you, what macroscopic properties will the matter in the box have, right? Well, okay, I didn't actually give you enough information because it depends on the pressure and the temperature of the box. So a standard pressure, if it's a very hot box, of course it will be full of steam. Uh, kind of room temperature will probably be full of liquid, and uh, you know if it's cold, it'll be full of ice. So really, it has very different behaviors macroscopically, even though all these boxes are filled with the same molecules interacting via the same interaction, right? And in fact, there's even more non-trivial behavior, right? There's presences of phase transitions between the, the different phases. Uh, there's a triple point where they can all exist at the same time, and there's a critical point as well over here where you can go around one way and not have a first order phase transition, but the other way you do it. Uh, and this is all with a force that we understand very well. So I'm a nuclear physicist, and so the question I ask is, what happens to the space diagram if there's other types of interaction forces, right? Something that maybe we don't understand as well. So that brings me now to the standard model. So the standard model is our theory that describes three of the four fundamental forces of nature. Uh, it, it, it describes all the interactions of these particles, and uh, you know we can kind of compactify the notation down to fit onto a mug. Um, so it's a very successful model. Um, 
and it can be summarized pretty neatly. And if I go back to our electrodynamics uh, example, right? Electrodynamics is the interaction of charged particles with the photon, right? Uh, the theory is known as quantum electrodynamics, very well known. And it's basically summarized by the interactions over there of uh, fermions with, with the photon, right? Um, but then I want to talk about one of the other forces of nature, which is quantum chromodynamics, right? So quantum chromodynamics is our fundamental theory of the strong nuclear force. And it describes interactions between colors, between particles that have color charge. So there are three color charges, red, blue, and green, which are kind of an analog to positive and negative electric charges. They're carried by the quarks, uh, shown here. And they interact with each other via the gluon, which is kind of the QCD uh, analog of the photon. And what makes QCD interesting and special is that not only do you have this interaction with the gluon and the, uh, the quark, shown on the left, but actually the gluons can interact with each other. And the gluons interacting with each other give rise to some very special phenomena. The first one of these is known as asymptotic freedom. So shown on this plot here is, a, is a, basically a plot of the interaction strength of the nuclear force as a function of the momentum transfer of the interaction. And uh, what we see is that at high momentum transfers, the interaction, uh, the interaction strength is weaker. So we call this asymptotic freedom. Quarks that are interacting with gluons at high momentum transfers don't feel the strong nuclear force very strongly, actually. It's somewhat weak, so they're fairly free. However, uh, in the low, inter uh, low trans uh, momentum transfer region, it's the other way around. They actually feel very, very strong interaction. So in this region, uh, known as the perturbative region, perturbation theory works. And we can do calculations of many observables that we'd like to study. However, in this uh, other region, this is known as the non perturbative region, it's very difficult to do theoretical calculations. And therefore, experimental input is very, very valuable. And so I'm an experimentalist, so of course, I find this non perturbative region very interesting. The other property of QCD is color confinement. So if you consider a quark and an anti quark interacting, uh, consider the, the fields between them. You can see a plot of that up there in the top middle of the slide. And if you, uh, if you increase the distance between the, the quark and the anti-quark, what you'll find is that the potential actually increases linear distance. It's not a 1 over r potential like quantum electrodynamics. So it doesn't go to zero at large distances. It actually goes to infinity. Um, of course, you can't have an infinite energy density. So it actually becomes energetically favorable to make a QQ bar pair out of the vacuum. That's shown by this diagram at the bottom, where if you have a quark anti quark pair, you pull them apart, uh, there's these strong field lines, and if you make a QQ bar pair, those field lines get terminated and reduce the total energy of the system. But then you have two pairs of QQ bar, right? And the, the consequence of this is basically that there's no free color charges in nature. They're all bound up into these particles that are color neutral. Uh, this is known as color confinement, and it's the reason why quarks are confined into what we know as hadrons, which are like protons and neutrons, uh, and also things like pions. All right, so now I have this QCD matter made out of quarks that are interacting and color confined. I want to ask, what happens if I put them in my box, right? So consider a box full of quarks and anti-quarks. Um, they can come in the form of baryons, which are protons and neutrons, things with three quarks, or mesons, which have a quark and an anti-quark. So I put those in the box and I ask, what's the phase diagram of this box? And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to plot this on a plot where the temperature is on the y-axis. And this axis has uh, a unit known as mu v, which is the baryon number of chemical potential. So if you're not an expert, you can think of this basically as the number of quarks in the box minus the number of anti-quarks in the box, so the quark excess. So, and kind of the matter that we experience on an everyday basis, uh, we're full of nuclei, atomic nuclei, right? And we're at fairly low temperature, all things considered. So we live around here uh, in this space diagram. But now I'm going to ask what happens if we kind of study the two axes of the diagram. So let's keep temperature low, and let's move along the mu v axis over here. So uh, in order to do this basically what we want to do is we want to hold the temperature low and we increase the number of quarks in our box, which is shown on this plot on the left, right? And 
We keep adding baryons, which are quarks without adding antiquarks, so that increases mu b, and we move along the x-axis. Eventually, you'll get to a point where the quarks are crushed together so much that they touch each other, right? The, the, the baryons touch each other. And when the baryons touch each other, the concept of a baryon, a package that's color neutral, doesn't really cease to make sense anymore. It's more of a collective kind of system. Uh, and this is actually a predicted transition to a phase of matter known as the color superconductor. Uh, and this color superconductor has been studied a lot theoretically, but we can't experimentally access it. But it's relevant for studies of like neutron star structure, where you have a lot of neutrons crammed together. And what's interesting is that very recently with this uh, uh, neutron star in spiral detections from LIGO and Virgo, we might be able to actually study the structure of neutron stars with gravitational waves. So we actually might be able to put constraints on the uh, phase diagram in this point. Now let me move on to the temperature axis. So let's go up the y-axis. So we keep mu b low, and we increase the temperature. So uh, as I increase the temperature and I want to hold mu b low, which means I need to add quarks and anti-quarks in equal amounts. So what happens is that QQ bar pairs are created out of the vacuum, basically to make more mesons. And actually, uh, on uh, Big supercomputers, people have done this calculation known as lattice QCD. And you can see here that the energy density of the system around 250 uh, MeV actually exponentially rises. Uh, and that is actually known as a crossover phase transition. So there's actually a phase transition that occurs around 150 MeV. And that's roughly where the mesons start to touch each other again. right? So the concept of a meson doesn't make sense anymore. And they become what's uh, known as a deconfined medium. And we call that medium the quark gluon plasma. So the quarks and anti-quarks and the gluons are kind of floating around, and they don't belong into a specific atom. So we can ask, what are the properties of this quark gluon plasma? And also, because there's, there was a phase transition over here, but there's not a like, first order phase transition over there, uh, that implies that there's a critical point somewhere. And we can say, where's that critical point? So the other reason to study the quark gluon plasma is that uh, the early universe, very shortly after the Big Bang, is predicted to have been a quark gluon plasma when it was very, very, very hot. So uh, basically, in the evolution of the universe, it started at very high temperature, and it quickly cooled down uh, and become kind of this pool of hadrons and eventually atoms and things that we have today. But also, we can actually experimentally recreate the quark gluon plasma and study this early universe conditions in the laboratory setting with high energy, heavy ion collisions, where we slam ions together and nearly this speed of light. And in these pictures, the ions are not spheres, they're pancakes, and that's because their lower ends contracted because they're moving at nearly the speed of light. So as the, as the heavy ion, uh, the quark gluon plasma made in the heavy ion collision cools off, it turns back into hadrons because of color confinement as it goes through this phase transition again. And we are actually able to detect those hadrons and we use that data to make inferences about what the properties of the quark gluon plasma Okay, so how do you make these heavy ion collisions? Well, there's two places. Uh, the first is the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. This is located on Long Island at Brookhaven National Lab. And that's a dedicated heavy ion facility, so it runs more or less year-round. And they have very uh, months long of data taking. Uh, and it has a top energy of around 200 GeV for each nuclear pair in the collision. Um, RIC is nice because it can accelerate almost any element. So it has a lot of versatility, right? We can do a lot of different systems, uh, a lot of different collision systems and things like that. There's a, one other place you can uh, do these collisions. That's the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is also very useful for the high energy physics uh, collisions where they collide protons. So because of that, we have to share time with them. So we only get to run the heavy ions for about one month out of every year. Uh, we do have a much higher uh, top energy of around five and a half TeV. Uh, and if you multiply that by the number of nucleons in lead, what you'll find is that the total collision energy is almost one PeV. So these are huge, huge collisions for just two particles to undergo, right? Uh, and we're also more limited on what types of uh, particles we can accelerate. We do protons, lead, and there was a short run of xenon. But other than that, we focus mostly on that. So both RIC and the LHC are very complementary to each other. And a lot of the conclusions that we have found from one translate very well over to the other. However, I'm just going to talk about the LHC because that's what I work on for 
So at the LHC, uh, there are experiments where the two beams uh, intersect. This is the one I work on. It's the compact muon solenoid. Uh, it's a general purpose experiment, so it's also the experiment that, for example, discovered the Higgs boson along with Atlas. Um, and don't be fooled by the name. Even though it says compact, it's 50 feet tall, weighs 14,000 tons. It's, it's a huge experiment. Uh, and it has a almost four Tesla magnetic field. That may, that's about the same as an MRI machine, although this thing is about the size of maybe a small house, right? Um, and so we have around 2,000 physicists who all work together to make sure that this, this machine works correctly and um, has nice data that we can examine. So when these heavy-ion co uh, collisions collide in CMS, this is an example of what happens. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of particles being produced, right? We make such a high energy density that when everything turns into hadrons, they're just a massive amount of particles, right? And I'm actually in charge of the so uh, software, along with uh, a group I work with, that reconstructs all the yellow lines in this event. Um, and as you can see, it looks like in one just huge blob, right? So I'm trying to make sure that the trajectory of every single line in this equation is, is quite the challenging task. Um, and it takes a lot of work, but uh, it's also very uh, interesting. And uh, what's interesting, I think, is that as the Large Hadron Collider becomes more uh, efficient at delivering proton-proton collisions, the people in high energy physics actually are slowly getting to the point where in one beam crossing, their events look almost similar to this, right? So there's some interplay uh, in the methods of how you reconstruct these events with the high energy physics communities. Okay, the one thing we do not have control over in these heavy ion collisions is we cannot control the impact parameter of the two ions. Okay, um, because we don't have the impact parameter and because the ions are extended objects, uh, essentially you can have collisions where they only glance off each other. These are known as peripheral collisions and you can have collisions where they hit each other head on. These are known as central collisions. And as, of course, as you hit head on, you deposit more energy, more particles are produced. So what we do is we typically use uh, the amount of particles produced in order to classify the events. Uh, is peripheral, middle, or central events. And we indicate that with a percentage. So you'll see this a lot in heavy ion physics. Lower percentages mean more head-on, right? So 0% is fully head-on. 100% means that they barely hit each other, okay? So that's something to uh, keep in mind as we move forward. Now, let me talk about some properties of the quark muon plasma, okay? The first is known as hydrodynamic. So as I said, the nuclei don't necessarily hit each other head on. So for example, in the top right corner here, you can see that they hit each other and only about half of each ion interacts in the middle there. And you can see that this region where they interacted is kind of almond shaped, right? It's not spherical. And that's actually very, very important because if you think about it, outside of that almond, the vacuum is vacuum, zero pressure. At the center of that almond is very, very high pressure because there's a very high energy density. So if you consider the pressure gradient in the vertical direction, and you compare it to the pressure gradient in the horizontal direction, they're actually very different. And that, that um, pressure gradient actually forces the quark gluon plasma to expand more in the short direction than in the long direction, okay? So this is actually kind of simulated in a larger system of ultra-cold lithium-6 atoms, which is shown in this plot here, where they start with kind of an almond shape they allow it to expand as a strongly coupled fluid, and you can see that in the final state, uh, the particles are actually moving more in the horizontal direction because of these pressure gradients. Okay, And this is a property, this kind of correlation between the initial pressure gradients and the final state momentum is a property of uh, hydrodynamics, Okay, relativistic hydrodynamics. So essentially what we're saying is that the core gluon plasma behaves like a fluid that can be described by hydrodynamics, and it does not behave like a weakly interacting gas, which is not trivial because, as I said, the QGP is deconfined. So there could be an expectation that it's somewhat weakly interacting. But even though we manage to deconfine the quarks and gluons, they still interact with each other very, very strongly. 
And so this type of pressure-driven expansion, although we see it in this lithium-6 event, we can actually see it very clearly in our event displays here. So this is kind of uh, looking at the end of CMS where the uh, ions come in and out. And you can actually see that there's more energy deposited in this direction than in this direction. And that's just because uh, the, uh, the uh, momentum bo was boosted in this axis because of the initial geometry. So the way we measure this uh, uh, anisotropy is to use a technique uh, known as particle two-particle correlations, right? So uh, these global correlations uh, can be measured essentially using a plot shown on the left where uh, uh, you basically ask, given one the location of one particle, right, what's, where's the probability of finding another particle in the event? Okay? So in, in the, at 0, 0, that means you're the most likely to find a particle right next to the particle you're looking at. And uh, further away, you can see that the uh, probability is actually very non-trivial. There's a non-trivial structure with kind of a sinusoidal um, behavior along this red line out here. So this kind of um, front part shown here of the sinusoidal wave is known as the near side bridge. Okay. The, the, the back half is, is something that can be explained with other effects, but the near side bridge is something that is a hallmark of collective effects in this hydrodynamic uh, behavior that I mentioned previously. In order to quantify that near side bridge, what we can do is we can actually take the red line uh, and we can plot it on one uh, plot like this, and we can do a Fourier fit. So you can use a Fourier expansion to fit pretty much anything, right? Uh, but what you'll find is that uh, the, uh, the uh, contribution from the sinusoid that has two oscillations per period uh, has usually a very large contribution, and that's known as V2. You know, the coefficient of that is known as V2. And so V2 is usually the kind of hallmark uh, observable that is used to quantify this uh, hydrodynamic effect. Okay, um, so we have measured all these Vn's, including V2. And we've actually done Bayesian analysis of all these data in order to try to extract parameters of the quark gluon plasma. And in particular, this plot here is showing the viscosity of the quark gluon plasma uh, divided by the entropy density. And what's really interesting about this plot is that uh, the quark gluon plasma is much less viscous than water or liquid helium, right? And in fact, uh, there have been theoretical calculations on the limit how non-viscous matter can be, and the quark gluon plasma is very, very close to this limit. So this is done with uh, an ADS-CFT calculation, and you can see the quark gluon plasma at the critical temperature, nearly at that value. So this has prompted people to call the quark gluon plasma as a perfect liquid, uh, in the sense that it has a viscosity that is almost as low as you can get, right? Um, and that's very important, actually, because uh, shear viscosity actually um, inhibits the correlation between this initial pressure gradient with the final state momentum anisotropies that I mentioned that were a hallmark of hydrodynamics. So the, because the viscosity is almost as low as it can get, that means that the correlation between the initial geometry and the final state momentum is very good, and that means that initial geometry is extremely important in these heavy Okay, so we measured this near side ridge in lead lead collisions where two ions hit each other. But then actually, some people started searching in different types of collisions. So they looked in proton proton collisions where they selected events that have a really high amount of particles produced, as shown here. And they actually saw a very small ridge here. And that was quite surprising. People were not expecting it that, that at the time. Um, so people actually didn't know what to make of that. But then people started doing studies also where they collided one proton with the lead ion, right? So you basically uh, drill out a hole in the lead ion with one proton. And they actually saw a ridge as well. And then that got people really excited. And, and um, these systems, which are originally thought to be too dilute in order to produce a core gluon plasma, it was actually realized that it might be possible where you form a very small droplet of core gluon plasma right in the middle in the collision system. For example, the energy density for pulling a collision is shown there. So this got people really, really excited. Uh, there were more measurements done, 
in proton-proton collisions where they tried to do this in, in collisions with less and less event activity, what they actually found was that this V2 parameter is not zero even when you go down to collisions with somewhat low event activity, something like 30 or 40 tracks. Um, so at that point, the interpretation of that signal becomes difficult because there are large contributions from so-called non-flow modes, which are modes that aren't really caused by hydrodynamics. For example, momentum conservation and things like that. Um, so then it, that kind of you know, begs the question, what exactly is this small droplet of quark gluon plasma? At what point are we making a quark gluon plasma? At what point are we not really making a quark gluon plasma? Um, so this is, we're kind of unsure. Uh, but there's many explanations like scattering of partons, initial state effects, the so-called escape. This is an open question. Yeah, so uh, I kind of summarize this here. So if you look at kind of the spectrum of uh, basically sizes of the energy densities you can create going from proton-proton collisions all the way over to peripheral uh, lead-lead collisions all the way to central lead-lead collisions, we know hydrodynamics works very well in, in central collisions. But at some point, it becomes uncertain as to if that's the ex uh, correct explanation for this phenomenon. Uh, so we'd like to know really what are the causes of these anisotropies in small collision systems. Uh, can these effects be described by hydrodynamics? Or is there some other explanation? Um, and if there is some other explanation, how does this hydro picture that we see in central events emerge from this picture we have at smaller, uh, smaller collision sizes, right? How does that transition happen? And also, we'd like to know what are the minimum conditions to see the signal? Because we see the signal in almost every system that we've studied. So is it always there? Can we turn it off? Right. So these are all really interesting questions. So for that last question, there was a very interesting paper um, written recent, uh, somewhat recently in 2018, where they basically mentioned that you know proton-proton collisions are very still very complicated systems. Uh, protons have internal structure because they're not fundamental particles. Uh, there's things like initial state radiation, beam remnants, color reconnection. So it's all kind of summarizing that complicated diagram on the top left there. And so they said, all right, what if we just take the simplest collision system that we can think of, which is basically uh, an electron and a positron annihilating through a Z boson to make two quarks, right? And these two quarks can interact, but a lot of the complications from the proton-proton collision are gone. Right? And so they actually did this simulation, and what they found was that uh, normally they don't really see any type of this near side ridge. But they said if they tweaked kind of the interactions between the quarks a little bit, right, and um, they tweaked them enough, they actually were able to get a V2 signal, right? And that's, that's summarized by this plot here. So they concluded that, you know, maybe there's something with the scattering of partons or maybe some interaction of partons that could lead to this type of signal. And so, um, the, the question was, if we look at these very simple systems and we select a high multiplicity system, does that correlate with the signal we see? The problem is, uh, there's not really any places nowadays to look at electron positron annihilating to see both sides, right? Uh, so me and some other colleagues got together and we decided we really wanted to do this study, but there was no facility to do it. But we realized we could do it. We just had to go back in time 30 years, right? Um, so kind of a history lesson for people, maybe the younger people in the room. Uh, the LHC is shown here on the left-hand side. Uh, what did the LHC look like 30 years ago? Well, it's a trick question. The LHC did not exist 30 years ago. But the tunnel that the LHC is in did exist 30 years ago. And the reason why is because it was drilled for a different uh, collider, known as LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider. Okay, That's why these two uh, images look very geographically similar. It's the same tunnel, right? So the LHC collides billions of protons together each second. The LEP in 1998 can do about one collision per second. So this was, you know, 30 years ago, so things were a little bit uh, less technical, technologically advanced at the time. But nonetheless, we have access to uh, electron-positron collisions from LEP, so we can actually look at that data. So this is what the inside of the tunnel looks like. Uh, LHC has superconducting magnets, 
These were the magnets 30 years ago. They were born magnets, so they're not superconducting. Um, yeah, but the, it's the same facility, pretty much. So for the detector, we're actually using the LF detector, shown on this plot here. Uh, and the LF detector is actually an extremely clean uh, data set and very efficient detector. Right? So we have access to these data. They're stored as so-called energy flow objects, which are very similar to what CMS uses these days, actually. Uh, but still, there was still kind of detective work involved because this was taken 30 years ago. Most of the people that worked on this experiment have retired. Um, so you have to look up, for example, what nomenclature they used in their Monte Carlo, uh, things like that, which are all standardized today. But it wasn't 30 years ago. Anyway, so we looked at the data, and um, we found that there's a number of particles up to around 50 in these events, right? And in proton-proton collisions, we saw signals down to 30. So we said, okay, maybe there's a chance. So here's some event displays. So on the left is an event display with 39 tracks. So the the, Z uh, the two uh, electron and positron are coming into the, the page like this, and they scatter off this way. Uh, and you can see that most of the particles come off back to back. These structures are known as jets, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and this is an event that has a little bit more kind of uh, isotropic behavior, and this one has 40 electrons. These are some of the highest number of tracked events in the data set. OK, so we actually just repeated uh, some of the analyses that we do in proton-proton and heavy ion collision in this data set. So um, we actually did two types of analyses. The first is known as the basically the lab reference frame. It's basically the exact same thing that we do in proton-proton and heavy ion collisions. So that's shown in this middle plot here. And then we also did a, an additional study where we actually rotated our reference frame to put the QQ bar pair on the z-axis. So we'd like to study the behavior transverse to the QQ bar pair, uh, pair axis. And that's shown on the right-hand side plot. And if you look at the kind of uh, edge of this plot, you can see that we don't really see any sign of this near side ridge. So we wanted to quantify that a little bit more. So you can actually uh, take the projection along this uh, kind of uh, front edge of the plot, and then you get the, these data points, and we compare this to Monte Carlo generators. And you can see, actually, that most of the Monte Carlo generators do a decent job, although um, there's, uh, Herwig seems to be a little bit different than, for example, the Pithlia. And this is probably because they use different types of hadronization model. Um, but this is really interesting because, uh, in principle, all these uh, generators are tuned to the left data, because the left data was also precise. But we still even see, even with the tuning, when we put a, mul a multiplicity cut, and it doesn't necessarily agree all the time. OK, so since we didn't see any near side ridge, we decided to set confidence limits, uh, confidence limits on our result. So that's shown on this plot here. Basically, our results are the arrows pointing down with the uh, pr uh, confidence of the result. And then in the background, you can see actually the uh, the results for proton-proton, proton light proton light collisions. Uh, and they're all plotted as a function of the number of tracks in the event. And so you can see this, this data point here, which the purple arrow is pointing to, actually shows that we were able to just touch uh, basically the proton-proton uh, signal. Um, but we don't see any signal in the, in the same number of uh, tracks there. So this is actually pretty limited by statistics. Um, we can't really get any more events because LEP has closed down, obviously. Um, so this is kind of the current state of the art. And um, as I said, we need more statistics, but we'd have to build a new collider for that. So that won't happen anytime soon. So then we thought, OK, how can we make the system a little bit more complicated? Because the simplest system didn't show uh, the behavior we were looking for. So let's try to make it a little bit more complex. So then we said, OK, we can look at electron-proton collisions. So half of a PP collision. <laughs> um, so those are done at a different collider uh, at uh, Hera, Desi, and Hamburg from 1992 to 2007. Uh, and what's nice about this is actually the experimental collaborations in this detector are still alive, and they still have meetings every month or so, uh, and they're still very active. Um, so we can actually join a collaboration. So we joined the H1 collaboration, and we were able to do the study. So we looked at deep inelastic scattering events. That's essentially where the electron knocks out a quark or a gluon from the proton in a very hard process. And so the results are shown here. 
this is the correlation function. We don't really see any sign of this near side ridge. And we put limits on it, but uh, everything is pretty much consistent with zero. Right? So we don't see any sign of this near side ridge. But once again, we were just limited by the multiplicity. This one only went up to around 15 tracks or so. So then we started asking ourselves, OK, um, we pretty much exhausted all the data that was taken in the past. They could go to a high number of tracks. What can we do now? Um, you know, is there a smaller system with high multiplicity that is not proton proton collision? And we thought, well, you know, in this left data, we had these jets, which are these showers of particles that come from a big horse uh, uh, breaking up. And we have tons of these jets at the Large Hadron Collider. They're just made very, uh, very easily at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and there's actually huge physics programs focused on these jets. Uh, but most of them are focused on perturbative QCD features because those can be calculated by theory very, very well. But what we're looking for is not something that will be able to be calculated by PQCD, really. It's some non-perturbative uh, core gluon plasma-like effect, right? So why don't we explore these jets, which have a lot of particles kind of in a local area, local density, and let's explore the non-perturbative features, right? Is it possible that, for example, one quark fragmenting could fragment into a system of partons with a large local density that then interact with each other in some way that's similar to what we see in a proton proton collision? So, this is kind of the logic. So, uh, with a graduate student from here at Rice Parker, in the back there, we actually uh, did a, a study in simulated events. We looked at events that have up to 100 particles within them, so that's twice as much as the the highest event, part, uh, event, right, but only in one jet. Um, and what we found was that essentially um, we can look at all these observables that we have looked at in heavy ions and proton-proton collisions. We can look at look at them inside of a jet, looking at this kind of localized high density environment as well. So we did a study in simulation where we we examined like the V ends, another hallmark gluon plasma like observable known as the strangeness, strangeness enhancement, which is shown on this plot here. Things like Bose Einstein correlations, uh, things like this. And so basically, what we posit is that you know, these simulations, Monte Carlo generators, all have like very defined uh, predictions that come mostly from the simulation model. But if we see any deviations from that, you know, that could actually lead to a huge direction in the field where this local, high local density environment essentially could be used as a proxy for a smaller system than a proton proton collision. Right? Then we can repeat a whole uh, research program on these kind of uh, high multiplicity jets. Okay, so let me wrap up a little bit about small systems here. So I've expanded this kind of spectrum now to reflect uh, the new studies that we've done. So on the left, there's now uh, e plus e minus collisions, ZP collisions, and, and PPN jets, or jets and PP, excuse me. And so you can see that uh, we've rolled out kind of EP and uh, EE uh, collectivity to the multiplicities that we can access. But there's still a question mark in these proton proton collisions and, and PP jet, uh, jets and PP collisions. Uh, so basically, we have kind of uh, started attacking the problem from the other side. Right previously, we were pushing from the right down to the left as far as we could go. Now we've actually opened up a new frontier on the left, and we're pushing up from the right, and we're trying to squeeze the region where we see this effect, emergent effect, uh, down, right? Um, and actually, the lessons we learned in EP collisions actually now motivated this search, for example, for the uh, jets in PP. Um, yeah, so ideally, we would like this kind of scaling up and down in system size to eventually converge at some point. And at that point, you know, we can do a really focused study on exactly what happens when we transition between no effect and, and an effect, and we can actually get a greater understanding of the requirements for these collective effects. And at that point, we would learn, you know, how how much of an energy density we need in order to make this QGP properly. Okay, so now let me kind of shift gears and talk about another property of the core gluon plasma. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, we have these jets which are essentially partons that were, have a lot of energy and then fragment into a lot of particles, the spray of particles. And these partons, because they have a lot of energy, actually probe the core gluon plasma 
at very short length scales. So you can think of it almost as taking an x-ray of the core gluon plasma, right? You probe the matter with something that has a very short wavelength. Um, actually, but if you put these jets in the core gluon plasma, the medium actually causes the parton to experience collisions, and it also causes it to radiate more gluons than if it was in vacuum. Okay? Uh, this effect is known as quenching, because what happens is that the parton that has a lot of energy actually dumps its energy into the surrounding core gluon plasma, just like you know, if you shot a gun underwater, you would experience a huge drag effect, right? Um, so the amount of energy that it loses actually depends on how far it travels through the core gluon plasma as well. It depends on the path. Uh, so you can actually have effects like this, shown in the bottom left here, where you have two jets produced back to back. One of them immediately exits the core gluon plasma because it's produced close to the edge, where the other one actually goes through the entire core gluon plasma. So the one going to the left actually experiences much greater quenching than the one on the right. It loses more energy. You can see an example of this from this LHC event, which was used in this discovery of jet quenching here. And you can see that this first jet is probably unquenched or didn't lose that much energy. But the one that went through the core gluon plasma lost a huge amount of energy to the point where it's almost not even detectable anymore. Right? So this is a very clear example of this jet quenching phenomenon. Um, and actually, what's interesting is that not only does the entire jet lose energy, but individual particles that are created in the jet also lose energy, right? So if you just look at particle spectra, you can actually see the imprint of jet quenching. So that brings me to this uh, so-called nuclear modification factor, or RAA. So essentially, uh, what people try to do with this observable is to compare spectra in lead-lead collisions with proton-proton collisions. So it's just a ratio uh, here, where on the numerator, you just have the number of things produced uh, in a in a lead-lead collision, and the denominator is a cross-section of that in a proton-proton collision. And then there's this TAA factor, which is essentially just a scaling normalization factor, okay? We can calculate that uh, TAA factor using a simple uh, Monte Carlo model that's based mostly on geometry, where you just throw bags of nucleons on each other, and you count how many in each other. It's a very simple model, but it does have some parameters, and that leads to uh, a significant source of uncertainty in this observable. But essentially, if this uh, TAA value scales appropriately, the conventional wisdom is that RAA equals 1 implies that there's no quenching in the event, right? Because you can ex uh, express the yield in a lead lead collision it's just a superposition of many proton-proton collisions, right? So if you just add proton-proton collisions, there's no quenching or anything like that. You should just get uh, some value where the numerator and denominator are the same. So we can measure this RAA. This is actually the uh, study that I did in my PhD thesis uh, for charged hadrons. And you can see that it's very much not one. We see a huge, huge suppression at IPT of this RAA factor. It's nearly a factor of seven or eight. Right? This is a huge effect. These particles lose so much energy right, that if you look even on a log log plot, you can see the points move very clearly. Um, so this actually, this study, uh, I show here the, the new data points or the yellow data points, but this RAA observable is not new. It's been measured at RIC. Uh, here it's been measured by the SPS. There's theoretical calculations, right? So this, uh, this study was actually very influential. It has almost 250 citations. It was featured in the CERN Courier. Um, but in fact, uh, this kind of plot that summarizes RAA is only for charged hadrons. There's actually a huge amount of data. Uh, for example, RAA for jets in the field. People have measured RAA for D mesons, right? RAA for B mesons. RAA for charmonia like j -Psi and Upsilon, and RAA for strange hadrons. And this is only LHC results in lead-lead collisions. There's more results for RIC. There's more results in xenon-xenon collisions, right? RAA is absolutely everywhere in the field. It is a ubiquitous quantity in our field, OK? So this, um, this RAA observable is used uh, to quantify Jet quenching, we would like to actually see 
at one point jet quenching turns off, just like for our uh, V2. We want to see if at a certain point quenching goes away because we don't produce a core neuron plasma, for example, or maybe just the path length that the jets go through is not long enough to produce a measurable effect. So we've actually seen that there's this suppression all the way up to around 70% events, which are, remember, a larger percentage is more glancing collision. But actually, it becomes uncertain after the 70% um, percent mark. And the conventional wisdom, as I said, is that RIA should go to 1 as the collision size approaches PA collisions, because we have not seen quenching in PA collisions. So we would expect a smooth transition to uh, RA equals 1 in this kind of peripheral region. So we actually did this measurement uh, in, uh, along with the previous measurement that I showed. Uh, and you can see here RAA for lead lead collisions in the blue, xenon xenon collisions in the pink. Uh, and it's not 1 at all. And it's somewhere around 0.7 or 0.6, which is a very large suppression, actually. right? So that actually raises a lot of questions, right? because we do not expect a large jet quenching effect in these very peripheral events, but we see some very strong push downwards. Um, so this was a big surprise, actually. And in fact, uh, this was actually studied further by the Elise collaboration. And so what they're plotting here is they're plotting the RAA at a specific value as a function of centrality. And what they saw was in central events, there's this huge suppression, which I already mentioned, and it, it slowly increases. But then here, it actually turns around and goes the other way. And in the last bid, it's actually more suppressed than the most central bid. So people saw this and they said, what? Right? Uh, it's supposed to be monotonic, like monotonically going to one. What's going on? This is completely inconsistent with our interpretation of jet quenching going away in low density events. Right? Theorists didn't know what to do with this. I know some theorists just excluded these purple events because they said something's wrong. Right? So, there is actually a model that was uh, proposed, which is actually shown by this black line here. Uh, and this actually suggested that if you have a perfect probe, which is not quenched at all, right? Something that just goes straight through the medium, doesn't even know that the medium is there. They said RA should not equal one, okay? Uh, and that goes against everything we're taught when we say RA. This would go against what I told you two slides ago when I said unquenched probe, RA equals one, right? It's not trivial, and it's not something that people are used to thinking. But essentially, uh, they argue that there are effects related to correlations in the hard particle production and the soft particle production that's used to calculate the centrality calibration that could cause this. And also that there could be things related to the impact parameter dependence of individual nucleon-nucleon scatterings that can basically cause events in these very peripheral regions to look like they're slightly higher centrality than they are which would cause a depletion in these very peripheral events. And what's even more interesting is, if you look at the uncertainties here, for, for example, 50% events, the, the difference of this model from 1 is actually similar to the uncertainty, even at 50% events. 50% is much more central than we were expecting uh, for this effect to turn on. We were thinking maybe 80% was when this weird thing happened. It actually could be affecting our measurements all the way to 50%. And people use the 50% data in global fits all the time. So that can be a really big problem for the field, right? So I looked at this and I said, OK, it's a very interesting, but can we measure this black line, right? If we can measure it, then you know we can maybe prove that this, theory, this model works. So for that, we need an unquenched probe, something that just goes through the medium. And in fact, there is actually one. So the Z boson is what we chose. So Z bosons uh, live kind of down here in the electroweak sector. They don't have color charge. They don't interact with the strong nuclear force at all. And furthermore, they decay to electrons and muons. Electrons and muons have the same properties. They don't interact with the strong nuclear force. They just go through, right? So they, they don't interact with the core bone plasma at all. And in fact, the Z boson, which the invariant mass is shown on the left here, has very small backgrounds. Uh, and uh, it can be very me measured very precisely. So this is a perfect way of testing this unquenched probes model. Okay. Here's an example of a Z-boson event decaying to two electrons. The electrons are the large green towers that I have shown here. 
Okay, so we wanted, just to cover our bases, we wanted to make sure that the C boson really doesn't interact with the core block plasma. So in order to do that, what we did is we actually decided to first measure the V2, which is the other observable I mentioned previously, right? Uh, so the idea here, as shown on the bottom left, is that if the Z boson gets caught up in this expanding medium, right, and it interacts with that medium, it'll get a boost to one side or the other. But if it doesn't even interact with that medium, it'll just go straight on like nothing ever happened, right? And so that will actually cause an azimuthal distribution in the Z boson V2, uh, or sorry, the Z boson yield, which will cause a non-zero boost. So we measured this, and we actually found that if you look at this data point, which is all the data together, that the V2 is essentially consistent with zero. And furthermore, this measurement is much, much more precise than the previous measurement, right? So we have constrained very, very precisely that Z bosons don't really interact with the medium, which is good news because that means that we can use them to test this model that we want to test. Okay, so then we went on and we tried to do this measurement. So uh, it's shown here, basically this is the yields of Z bosons measured as a function of centrality, which is kind of an analog to the black line I showed a few seconds ago. And the model is actually shown uh, here in the hatched green lines, okay? And so what we see is the Z boson yields are flat in central events, which is uh, as expected. And then in peripheral events, we actually see a dropping, which correlates very well with the model, right? So this means that the centrality calibration and event selection effects that this model proposes seem to be very important factors when we look in these peripheral collisions, right? And it also means that no quenching does not necessarily imply RAA equals one, which is what we're always taught uh, kind of in an introductory course about this, right? Uh, past 50% or so, between 50 and 90 percent Okay? So is that a big problem, right? Uh, this muddles kind of the interpretation for a large number of the measurements in our field, right? I showed you all these measurements. If we can't trust any of the measurements past 50%, we have a big problem, right? In fact, we think that there's a way out of this. So what if we compare RAA of whatever particle of interest to Z bosons? So basically a double ratio shown here. What's really interesting about this double ratio is remember those TAA factors I talked about, which were some scaling factor that had uncertainties? They cancel out. We do, it becomes model independent. Right? We don't depend on that model anymore. We don't need those uncertainties anymore. And in fact, also, this cross-section of Z bosons, that's a standard model measurement that high energy physics people do very precisely. Right? The, the current precision is, I think, 2.3%. So that's very well done. So that means that this observable can be measured very precisely, and it doesn't have model dependence, and it doesn't have uncertainties from TAA, right? And this ratio is 1 when there's no quenching, which is what we intuitively want. Furthermore, I believe that this could even be extended to proton light or PP collisions where you do other types of selections, right? So this provides a way forward for these 50 to 100% RAA observables in the future. And as we collect more Z bosons in the LHC going forward, I believe this technique will be very, very valuable. Okay, so let me wrap up about the jet quenching. So, um, we still have questions remaining about this kind of most interesting region where we transition from large heavy ion collisions to smaller systems, right? You can see that kind of summarized by these dotted lines. We're now attacking this uh, topic of collectivity from both, both sides of the uh, diagram here, basically. And we think that measurements of proton-proton uh, uh, jets could even push this further. For jet quenching measurements, we've kind of found a way forward that requires a transition in order to uh, a transition to a precision era, right? Where we use observables, where a large uncertainty is canceled, and uh, observables that can be measured with very low uncertainties, right? But we have in, uh, in the future new data sets coming, new detectors coming, new facilities coming, which will help with this. I believe. So let me quickly talk about the future, and then I'll wrap up here. So at the LHC. Uh, this is the timeline for the LHC going all the way to 2041. Uh, there is a heavy ion run in the dark green. So you can see, for example, from 2022 to 2025, there's run three. We'll get four heavy ion runs. Then there will be a shutdown, actually, where we will upgrade the detector, and then we'll start again in 2029, all the way to 2032. 
Uh, also, though, we have massive proton-proton data sets, which I mentioned earlier, can be used for studying for small systems like uh, jets and proton-proton collisions. So we have a huge amount of opportunity to study the questions I talked about in the previous slide, right? Also, there's exciting new detector upgrades, as I mentioned. For example, at run three, which is coming up right now, we have a new high granularity calorimeter. And in run four, we're going to have this uh, MTD detector, which could give us particle identification capabilities. Uh, there's also plans for short uh, commissioning runs, like oxygen oxygen collisions, proton oxygen collisions, and so forth, which could also be very useful. And of course, as the LHC continues to run, it delivers more and more and more luminosity. So the data sets will get bigger and bigger. There's also a future at RIC. So RIC has a new detector known as SPHOENIX that is expected to turn on quite soon. It will run for around three years. And what's interesting about RIC is that it's a fully, uh, has a full calor calorimeter, which means it'll be great for doing jet studies. So the data from SPHOENIX will be really good as a complementary tool to study at both jets at both uh, LHC and RIC. After those three years then, things were shut down because RIC will be upgraded to a new collider known as the Electron Ion Collider. You can see the calendar for the developments that are kind of roughly planned here. Uh, and so this Electron Ion Collider is really, the development for it is really like just now beginning. Um, so there's, for example, this uh, ESHE particle detector which is being proposed and there's discussions like literally right now about what this will look like. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to be involved kind of in these type of projects. And I think the physics uh, you know, of this electron ion collider is really interesting because uh, it will allow us to basically uh, do precision tomography of, of nuclei, right? And we can study the initial state of these nuclei very, very precisely, which could help us understand these small systems where we know that the initial state is a very important factor uh, when, when looking at these Asymmetrical correlations and things like that. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. So heavy ion collisions provide a really unique opportunity to study strongly interacting matter. Uh, there's connections to cosmology in the early universe, for example, condensed matter physics, high energy physics, so on and so forth. Uh, the core gluon plasma exhibits a really rich set of convergent phenomena that are not obvious from just looking at the QC Lagrangian, for example. Um, and I think this kind of connects with uh, the philosophy of physics as a whole, where what we like to do is start from simple systems and build up more and more complicated systems, right? In the quark gluon plasma, we're starting from just a soup of quarks and gluons, but we see a huge amount of phenomena that occur, right? And uh, I think it's very interesting to try to understand all those phenomena. We still have some questions about the exact requirements, for example, for creating a quark gluon plasma, whether or not we make a droplet of quark gluon plasma, especially in these small systems. Um, but I think in the next decade, there's really exciting opportunities uh, to revolutionize our understanding of this quark gluon plasma and the emergent phenomenon that uh, occur. So that's uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have time for questions. Sorry. Yeah, sure. So um, coming back to the ridge effect and your V2 measurements when you were trying other types of colliders, uh, you talked about EP and how you didn't see the effect there, but did you consider um, a subclass of events uh, from photo production processes where essentially nearly real photon, which can have like a hadronic-like structure to it? I, did, I didn't show it, but actually this paper has a photo production okay. section in it. We don't see any effect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We don't see any effect up to certain. Not, but yeah, not that, that's true. Yeah. We, we just still not know. Um, a sort of related um, topic is there's actually been a fairly recent paper that came out uh, where people look at uh, photon nuclei, nucleus collisions at the LHC, where the photon comes off one of the nuclei because they have very strong electric fields, and it hits the other nucleus. And in fact, you don't treat that photon as a photon, you treat it as a rho meson because of this uh, so-called vector meson dominance picture, if you're familiar with that. And they actually did find the V2 signal in these events.
but the interpretation of this V2 signal is very, very challenging. The, the system is almost boosted out of the detector uh, because uh, the kinematics are not really optimized for the LHC. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a really interesting signal. It's something that maybe we can also study in CMS. But the interpretation right now is, is very much up in the air. But I think it's a similar idea, right? So you might be interested in looking at that. Maybe you have to talk to the OHCP colleagues if they'll run the experiment with it. Okay. Oh, if people, if people uh, online have any questions, oh, okay. you, you, should, you should type. Uh... Yeah, can, can you hear me? This is Frank. Uh, okay. okay, so, well, we're very, we're very exciting, and so, oh, let me do it. Oh, sorry, Frank, but we can't hear you. I have it turned off because the feedback. Did you just? Yeah, it's prob it? probably easier to turn the mic to uh, turn on. I, I just have just a couple of comments, and it's really I uh, enjoyed your talk a lot. Um, I think it was not a fair representation to claim that only the LHC and only Rick are the uh, only uh, facilities that do heavy iron collisions. There are quite a few more. Um, there is uh, a GSI, an active program. There's an active program at Nika uh, in Dubna. So there, there, there are actually quite a few more. And, and, and the SPS, not, let's not forget the SPS, where a heavy iron program is running as well. So there's, uh, there's a few more facilities that are, that are used. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, bring up, right? I mean, you, you make indeed a good point that um, RAA equals one does not mean that there is no quenching. But we knew that already, right? Um, we know that um, if you go to, say, lower momenta, that um, the, uh, the effects like radial flow are affecting RAA quite a bit. And that's, that's not new, that, that, that we know. And then exactly comes back to the, the correct comment that you made, which is, what do you use to um, uh, gauge your RAA with? But I just want to point out that we know that the RAA is a, uh, a quantity that needs care to be interpreted. That's what I want to bring up. Okay, yeah, thank you for the comments, Frank. So, so let me just, for the people in the room, I can repeat the very beginning because we actually missed it. But uh, essentially, Frank was saying that uh, my, my, my uh, statement that uh, LHC and RIC are the only facilities that do heavy and is not true. And that, that, what you said is true. There's other, other facilities, but they are uh, a little bit more focused on lower energies and slightly higher UV in the phase diagram plot than what I, what I showed here. But, but Frank is correct. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and Frank, I agree with, uh, with your other statement as well. Uh, we know there are other effects that do cause minor deviations, RA equals one, even with unquenched probes. Uh, but in general, those effects are much smaller than the very large quenching effects that we observe. Uh, when you go to these peripheral events, though, uh, yeah, that's something that we definitely have to treat here. Yeah, we can talk about what we consider small. I think that the RAA in low energy collisions is actually really large. Uh, and that's really all because of radial flow almost that drives it up above one, in fact. And so, um, you know, it, it, the effects are there. But like I said before, it depends very much in what, you know, um, where you're using and what, how you like to interpret <laughs> RAA, I suppose. Um, but these conclusions, then the results that you've shown here, are of course very interesting. Uh, so I see another hand raised, Sion. Yeah. Uh, yes. So thanks for the talk. So about the HGPPI model, 
is that there any physical motivation for that? And does it apply for all particles with no color charge? Yeah, so the, the question is, is there any physics motivation for this HD Pythia model? And does it only apply for particles with no color charge? So yeah, uh, it's, it's essentially now uh, only used for probes that have no uh, interaction with the medium. It's actually modeled as a superposition of proton-proton collisions, which is essentially what I mentioned this TAA scaling factor is also kind of modeled, modeled as. It's just done in a, in a Monte Carlo fashion. Uh, in, in terms of the actual physics model, there is actually not really a good um, heavy ion physics model necessarily in HD Pythia. It's actually just overlaid Pythia events. So you just take Pythia, you run Pythia, and you overlay uh, the events on top of each other. Right? So it's kind of meant as um, a proxy for really just proton proton collisions with the correct. Uh, scaled uh, number of collisions within like a light ion conductor. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That answers the question. Okay. Thank you, and let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, everyone.